Okay, it says that we are live. This time it says six seconds. So for the hello, friends and family, brothers and sisters on YouTube world, um, we have the pleasure of bringing Scott Ritter back. Uh, in my opinion, the best military analyst. Scott Ritter is a former Marine intelligence officer who served as a chief inspector for the United Nations in Iraq, leading the search for Iraq's prescribed weapons of mass destructions. He has testified before the U.S. Congress, NATO, and the parliaments of several nations, and he's also the author of nine books. So we want to say thank you to Scott Ritter uh, from uh, Real True Talk and Angry War Hog. Welcome, well, thank Scott. you for having me. Yes, sir. Don't call um, me sir. Remember, I'm I'm a civilian now. <laughs> so <laughs> we all outrank all those guys that are officers. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to come out with my, I have a question. My first question is, what are the social ramifications of the U.S. secret support for Nazism in the Ukraine and the correlation between Jim Crow and the Nazi Germany coexisting with, with Crow Regiment, pre-existing and surviving 20 plus years after without any sufficient overhauling of its banishment from our society wow <laughs> boom <laughs> straight up uh, that's a serious question um and i i'm not belittling it but you know this goes well beyond um you know military analysis um which i'm really really comfortable with and uh, this gets into you know social uh analysis you know, about you know the societal analysis uh and things of that nature and i'm i'm not as comfortable um with that so i i'm going to avoid um maybe going down the rabbit hole a little bit because what what happens is um like everybody else i have opinions and uh, like everybody else sometimes my opinions are very strongly held and like everybody else when opinions that are strongly held aren't linked to a sound factual basis um you end up alienating just about everybody in the world who might know something about that is that you're wrong so um i'm going to be careful here um because although i'm familiar with uh, jim crow laws and and uh, and things of that nature i can't call myself an expert on it what i will say is this just from a fundamental uh basis you know the united states claims to stand for something now we've been in we've been evolving as a nation for since our since our founding and I think most people who study Constitution and the constitutional law, you, everybody quotes the Federalist Papers and and so rightly so. I mean, that is the foundation of the of the thinking behind the Constitution. But we, we have to acknowledge it was a, an, an imperfect document. I mean, from the start. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't need so many amendments to fix it. Uh, but that's the beauty of the of the thing is that it's a document that is um, <clears throat> able to grow. Fact is, if you if you just have the Constitution without the Bill of Rights, the ten, the you know the the, the first ten amendments, it's a pretty lousy document um, <clears throat> because it doesn't protect <clears throat> uh, rights. It doesn't. Uh, it, I mean, it enshrines slavery, the, uh, the the institution of slavery. Uh, it's a compromise document, like anything. Um, when you take, you know, the the level of divisiveness. Divisive, divisiveness that existed in, in colonial America, um, the the problems that manifested themselves during the initial Articles of Confederation, and trying to turn this into something that could function, um, you know, as a as a nation state, compromises had to be made. So the Const uh, the Constitution was a compromise document. Um, you know, the Bill of Rights came on afterwards and, and and fixed it a little bit. But even after the Bill of Rights, you know, we still had slavery. Women didn't have the right to vote. Um, you know, and it's a document that um, seems to be designed to empower uh, the haves uh, and control the have-nots. Um, but we've been working on it as a society. We, I think we've recognized over the years uh, the, the imperfection of our country. Um, and and we are we are striving to get better um and so i think today while we're not a perfect country there's still rampant racism there's still economic inequalities there's still 
you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of problems out there. We know what we want to be. I think we, we, we know which direction we want to head. Um, and that direction cannot be associated with uh, the resurrection of Jim Crow laws. It cannot be associated with the legitimization of, um, of Nazi ideology. Um, I mean, you know, we can we can bring up, you know, Prescott Bush. We can bring up uh, everything uh, when we want to talk about the links between the United States and the rise of Nazi Germany and all that. That's history. And as I said, I'm not prepared right now to get into an in-depth discussion of that. What I can say is that most Americans today would say what we did back then was wrong, uh, morally wrong, uh, reprehensible, and um, not in keeping with what we claim to be as a nation. Um, and so when I take a look at um, some of the policies that we are embarking on as a nation, including uh, especially this, um, this support, this blind support we give to Ukraine, um, it's disturbing because under no circumstances can anybody um, drawing upon fact articulate a case that makes Ukraine as a nation worthy of the support of the American people. Um, Ukraine is the antithesis of what we stand for as a people. Uh, Ukraine is purely a product of propaganda. Um, it ignores reality um, and it's bankrupting the United States, not just fiscally, it's not just undermining our, um, our military, um, our national security interests, but it's uh, bankrupting us morally because it's aligning us with an ideology that we supposedly fought a war to eliminate, and yet here we are today uh, promoting it, reinforcing it. You know, back in 1944, uh, Henry Morgenthau was the uh, Secretary of the Treasury for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and um, he rightfully, rightfully, I say, um, said Germany can no longer be allowed to exist as a nation state. We've allowed, uh, you know, Germany uh, two chances. They got two strikes uh, against them uh, where they combined uh, militarism with industrialism to create um, nations that ended up posing existential threats to the world. And they were defeated both times. And so the idea was we're not going to give them a third chance. We're going to break this thing up. We're going to deindustrialize Germany. Um, and, and, and we're going to basically make it incapable of ever replicating what it was. But that plan didn't work. I mean, we got into Cold War politics. Uh, the Marshall Plan uh, needed German industrial capacity in order to become viable. So instead of eliminating German industry, German industry, we, we helped revive it and, and get it back in place. The reason why I bring this up is um, the Germans just recently made a decision under American pressure to... Uh, to provide leopard tanks to Ukraine. So I just, I want people to let that sink in for a second. Germany is providing tanks to a Nazi regime to kill Russians. They've learned nothing. Uh, and the company that's doing that, Rheinmetall AG, uh, is headquartered in Dusseldorf, which is the, the sort of the epicenter of the area we call the Ruhr area. And that was specifically singled out by Morgan thought to be deindustrialized, all industry to just be dismantled, mines to be collapsed, nothing. It will never again be involved in industry. Um, and the other part of it is that the people that worked in these factories were to be dispersed, dispersed. They wouldn't be allowed to be concentrated. Germany would could not be trusted with this kind of industry. And Germany has proven Morgan thought correct. Today, Rheinmetall Metal AG is producing the Leopard tank. They're behind, uh, you know, they're, they're enthusiastically uh, talking about sending German tanks to Ukraine to kill Russians. I wish Henry Morgenthau was alive today, and I wish we'd enact that. Germany doesn't have a right to exist as a modern nation state, given its history and what it's doing today. You know, they used to have a guy named Willy Brandt who talked about never again, meaning not just never again is Germany going to kill the Jews, but never again is Germany allow itself to manifest itself in a manner which conducts these kind of aggressive policies. German weapons will not be sent into conflict zones. Uh, he went, he received a Nobel Peace Prize for this. Um, he must be rolling in his grave today for what Ger Germany has become. So, um, yeah, I, I, I got off on a little tangent there, but uh, 
I'm about as anti-Nazi as you can get. And uh, this sickened me, sickens me what Germany is doing at our behest, by the way.